be active and uh, he's exuding all of this energy right through the screen just for you and me. We have to keep active. Um, exercise is what we refer, refer to as neuroprotective, okay? All right, so what are you uh, in store for us? So we have about 170 participants on. Thank you all for joining us. If this is your first time uh, coming on with us, we begin every week with exercise, no matter what, because exercise is critical to you staying healthy, mentally, and physically, all right? So we are a research center. We have over 40 research projects that we are collaborating with investigators around the globe. And our hope is to ultimately find a cure for memory impairment. So today you're gonna to hear from Dr. Monica Parker. She's gonna talk about the uh, research process and what you can anticipate if you become a research participant. Then you're gonna hear from Carlissa Carson from our Emory School of Law. She's gonna be talking about the volunteer clinic for veterans that they will be hosting. And then finally, um, before we end with, with Morgan, who's gonna talk about our healthy aging study, we'll hear from Dr. Kalisha Bonds Johnson. She's gonna be talking about managing difficult behaviors of individuals with dementia. Okay, so use the chat function or the Q&A function if you have questions. And then this session is being recorded. We'll send a link out for it. So welcome, Dr. Parker. Hey. Couldn't let you watch me dance today. All right. Um, as Cornelia gets ready to load up the um, PowerPoint screen, stream, I think it's important for us to realize if there's not anything we learned from the pandemic, we've learned how important it is for people to participate in clinical research. Why? As you learned that certain groups of people were disproportionately affected by both the illness or hospitalizations and death from COVID, and that included people who were overweight, certainly people who were of color, and people who were diabetics. We then found out that there was a vaccine. We needed to do research to make sure that the vaccines that were developed were gonna be appropriate for all groups of people. So earlier in 2020, you had a lot of people who were participating in research. And as a result of that research participation, we've developed several vaccines that have been proven to be efficacious or effective in terms of preventing the um, deaths and illness as a result of COVID. Well, just like with the COVID infection, Alzheimer's disease is a, I like to say, a many splendored thing. There are lots of different things that can cause Alzheimer's. It's a neurodegenerative process. Yes, we know that. But we also know that as people get older, certainly over the age of 75, they're at greater risk for developing some type of dementia. What we're doing here at the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is studying people who are healthy to try to better understand how we may be able to impact this disease. Drugs and things that have been developed for treating Alzheimer's disease haven't been effective thus far. And we think that that is because people get to the medication late. We start treating the disease well after it's well engaged. The idea is that we need to start identifying people who are at risk and start making sure that we develop those medications, those diagnostic procedures that are more likely to help us understand how we can intervene. So there is a drug, an interventional drug that may reverse some of the neurodegeneration or certainly slow the neurodegenerative process that's involved in Alzheimer's. But we do understand that research so far has shown us that there are many different things that contribute to the development of Alzheimer's. It's not just your genetics. It's not just getting old. It may be the environment. So one of the things that we do here is healthy aging. So we're gonna be talking a lot about people who are healthy. But for those of us who aren't so healthy, for those of us who have family members who may be suffering from this disease and how we can protect ourselves, that's what we're trying to do here. My purpose today is to try to tell you about the different types of research that are being conducted here and across the United States. It's important to appreciate the Emory Alzheimer's Disease Research Center 
is one of 30 such research centers around the country. That means there's not one in every single state. Next slide, please. So what is the kind of research that you can participate in? What is clinical research? That's what we do here. Clinical research is research that's conducted on human subjects. The vaccine trials were human subjects research, okay? So here at Emory, with respect to Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at brain tissue, we're looking at blood specimens, we're looking at cerebrospinal fluid. Those are things that we can do. But in addition to body fluids kind of research, there is research that studies how people behave. You know, how many people went and did got a memory screen? How many people take advantage of their preventive health things? That's epidemiologic and behavioral studies. Outcomes and health services research. Okay, one of the things that's gonna be important in the next couple of months is how many people got, for example, vaccinated against the COVID vaccine? And how has that COVID vaccination affected the likelihood that we will have an outbreak of COVID-19 or some variant thereof. So there's research that studies tissues and diseases, that's patient-oriented research. There is research that studies people behavior, people's behavior and the behavior, let's say, of a certain kind of disease. You know, if you live in rural Georgia, you may be subject to certain diseases that are associated with um, fertilizers and pesticides that are used for agricultural crops. Outcomes in health services research. The latter two research categories don't involve any kind of body fluid, but the first one may. The latter two studies don't necessarily require you to take a medication, but the first one may. So there's patient-oriented research, there's epidemiologic and behavioral research, and there's health outcomes and services research. Next, please. So for the patient-oriented research here at Alzheimer's, we have several types of studies that are going on here. We have studies of aging, just so that we are not giving people anything, we're just observing how people age. What are the factors that make it more likely that somebody who's 100 gets to 100 with all of their cognitive facilities intact and all their physical facilities intact? We have clinical trials that stress prevention or the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. There are drug treatment trials, there are infusions that are going on for those people who are at risk for developing Alzheimer's and have cognitive impairment due to those uh, risk factors or processes that are associated with Alzheimer's. There are studies that we're doing that are focusing on high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease and their relationship to dementia. If you've been paying attention to us, you know that heart disease or hypertension is a risk factor for developing dementia. Not necessarily Alzheimer's, but vascular disease. So we study hypertension, we study hypertensive treatment here. And then there are pilot studies. Those are studies that are where we look at 10 to 30 people, maybe 50 people, and we look and see if we can develop enough of a, um, a research database to fund larger amounts of research. So biomarkers, what are biomarkers? Those are things that monitor a disease process that provide evidence of a disease that allow us to track a disease process as it progresses. In Alzheimer's, we look at cerebrospinal fluid, biomarkers for Alzheimer's pathologies, that's the A-beta protein and tau protein. Um, we also look at images on a specialized x-ray, an MRI or a PET scan. So these are things that we're looking at, biomarkers, things in the organism that are biologic that indicate disease. And we're looking at biomarkers simply because we're trying to find out how we can find out when earlier, when we might be able to intervene with Alzheimer's mechanisms such that when we do develop a drug, we can use it at the appropriate time. And we do that based on biomarkers, or we will do that based on biomarkers. Next. So how do you get involved? OK, right now, if we were in front of you in the next couple of weeks, we'd be having a big forum and we'd say, are you interested in research? We'd have you fill it out and somebody would call you. But if you are interested in research, you're going to get some information and we're going to give you a call in line. There are two numbers that you can call if you're just interested in healthy research and Natalie Zimmerman or Crystal Davis will probably take that call from you to find out what kind of research we can get you involved in. 
We also have the Emory Healthy Aging Study, which is basically a no cost, low harm, no pinching, no poaching, no spitting, no nothing exam that you do online. And that allows you to come in for later studies. If you're gonna be in our Emory Healthy Brain Study, which is a longitudinal brain study, you'll come in after you've completed your online form and give us some body fluids. You may give us some blood, you may give us some cerebral spinal fluid, we'll get a brain image, an MRI and or a PET scan. And that helps us with our biomarker research. If you are seeing a doctor at Emory in the neurology clinic, you may be given an opportunity to participate in a clinical drug trial. Clinical drug trials are only gonna be something that are offered to people who have evidence of disease and have been given a proper diagnosis, but more importantly, they're under the care of a neurologist and a primary care doctor here at Emory. Next. The study coordinators I talked to you about a little earlier, Natalie Zimmerman and Crystal Davis, are people who will be giving you numbers to contact a little later if you're interested in some research here at Emory. Right now, we're not doing any in-person visits unless you're in the infusion studies. Some of the studies that we will be doing here will require you to complete a questionnaire. Um, you may have to get your brain imaged. You may have to get your blood pressure checked. Specimens that we may collect from you as a part of our clinical research process may be spit, maybe blood, maybe cerebral spinal fluid, maybe a little bit of skin. All of these aren't required for all of the studies, but for different studies. If you're in our unified data state, that's our longitudinal study that we're sharing with the um, many other um, Alzheimer's disease research centers in the country, there may be add-on studies. They may say, okay, this study says we're going to now collect um, spit, maybe we'll collect some skin, maybe we're going to do some eye tracking for all of our UDS participants. And when you come for your UDS visit, we may ask you if you want to participate in that study. Study participation is voluntary. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. It's all voluntary. Next. So different things occur in a study and one of the preliminary steps is determining whether or not you are eligible for the study. A coordinator is gonna call you and ask you a number of things and make you aware of what's required in the study and whether or not you fit the criteria. So different studies have different requirements. They'll ask you for different things. When it looks like you've met all the requirements to be in a study, you will give us permission. You will consent to enroll in the study. Some studies are only a one-time visit. Some studies require several visits. They take visits to get the consent. They take visits to get your blood specimens. They schedule another visit to get your brain MRI or your lumbar puncture. So different studies have different requirements. And when you talk to the coordinator, the coordinator will tell you what is expected of you in the trial or the study that you are particularly involved in. Next. Um, a lot of times here we have people say, well, I filled out this form and nobody called me. But I like to say that we're accountable here at Emory and because I'm advertising something or encouraging you to do something, if something hasn't worked out well, you call me. But one of the things that I'm really pleased about is most of our study coordinators make themselves accessible as do our investigators. So you will get a phone number for not only the coordinator, but also the medical doctor or PhD doctor who is doing the um, study. Next. What happens if I'm not eligible for any studies? Well, there may not be some studies that we're doing that you're eligible for. The Emory Healthy Aging Study, as I've talked about before, is something that everybody can enroll in. But another thing that I think I want you to get involved in is something called Research Match, www.researchmatch.org. That's something where you can sign yourself up for any study going on in the United States that you are interested in and periodically they'll be sent an email to ask you what your interests are. We have several studies here at the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center 
but you may not be a candidate for all of those studies. So please don't think that there's something that you must be involved in. We may not have something that specifically suits your needs, but that's why I want you to look at researchmatch.org. There are other studies that you can participate in. Next. Okay, what if you change your mind? As I said earlier, research participation is all voluntary. There's nothing that forces you to do anything. You're not going to be denied care. And more importantly, with healthy aging research, we don't, we're not giving you anything. We're not treating you for anything. So if you don't want to do something, you say no, no works. You don't have to participate anymore. You're not going to be penalized. Nothing's going to be withheld from you. That may be a little different if you're in a cancer chemotherapy trial, because a lot of times when people are in chemotherapy trials, there probably aren't any other alternatives. But research participation, whether it's for cancer chemotherapy or for Alzheimer's healthy aging research, all of this is voluntary. You have the right to withdraw and stop at any time. Keep going. So things that you might want to continue, consider when you're getting ready to enroll in a study. You may not be able to participate in all the things you think you want to be able to participate in because you can't participate in more than one study at a time. Sometimes the number of visits that are required for one study may be off-putting to you and you may decide not to participate in that study. If you have something that you feel may prevent you from participating fully in the study, you may want not may not want to participate. And more importantly, just because we get something from you doesn't mean that you are entitled to the results. So if we do um, a brain MRI and we see that you may have evidence for Alzheimer's, we may not necessarily tell you that. But our investigators are all going to tell you if there's something that is found that is abnormal and assist you with getting an assessment and getting you to the right people. If we find something abnormal in your laboratory work that needs to be addressed by your primary care doctor, we're gonna give you that information and get you to get back to your doctor if you have one, and if you don't, help you identify a healthcare resource to get that abnormality addressed. Research is not a substitute for good medical care but good ethical research investigators will see to it that you are given an opportunity to consult with a medical provider that you need to see if something abnormal is found. We won't be repeating Tuskegee here. Thank you. I think that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Um, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Okay, one question as uh, before we uh, transition. Um, a lot of our studies require you to have a study partner. Can you explain um, the study partner? Okay, one of the reasons you'll have a study partner here for Alzheimer's research, and that'll go with really any other kind of research, uh, but particularly in Alzheimer's research, we need somebody to corroborate or back up your story. If you say, I can't remember anything and I don't, you know, I want to understand why I can't remember anything. Your husband may come to the visit with you and say, she's got the mind of an elephant. She doesn't forget anything. So a lot of times we will um, have your study partner come with you mainly to kind of act as a backup for your story or not. Maybe the person who's your study partner may see something and report something to the study um, investigator that you haven't reported. The, well, she does everything really, really well, but you know we have noticed that she's had some trouble paying her bills lately. So we'll note that that may be a change, particularly when we're studying people who are healthy and otherwise people who don't really have any medical problems. So a study partner is really there to kind of add, um, provide extra information and also provide support for the person provide, participating in the research. Okay, and then one final note. You talked about sharing results. Mm -hmm. Do we, how or why does that occur with sharing results? With well, people? keep in mind, research is just that research, okay? 
and we're getting when you consent to research you're basically saying i'm giving you my opinion i'm giving you my information and um I know that because of, let's say, the IRB and other things, that if there's something that's found that's abnormal, you're going to let me know so that I can remain healthy and I can remain safe. But let's just say I'm studying um, high blood pressure and I enroll in the study because I'm a normal control. I don't have blood pressure. And in the course of the study, they discover that I have high blood pressure. Well, they're going to tell me that I have high blood pressure. And because the study is to look at people who don't have high blood pressure, but now I do, I'm probably going to have to get out of that study. So that kind of result, because it can be harmful to me, is something that the investigator is going to make me aware of so that I can get it addressed. But I may not necessarily tell you what's in your cerebrospinal fluid because there's nothing to tell. But things are moving such that in research now, we're getting to the point where we're trying to let you know what it is we found. The problem with a lot of research is some of the things that we find don't really mean anything. There's nothing we can offer you. There's nothing we can tell you about it. You know, if we find, for example, if we do an MRI and you have um, uh, hippocampal degeneration, which goes along with Alzheimer's, we can tell you that, but in our research, because we're observing you, we're really going to be looking at how things progress. If there is something, and this has happened in the 10 years or so that we've been doing this recruitment, we have studies that are prevention studies. So there may be, okay, she is showing signs that this is a problem, may become a problem for her. Is she eligible for any of these other studies? So as studies become available, we'll certainly make you aware of them, but more importantly, the results that you are going to get may not pertain to the study at all, but any ethical researcher who's collecting body fluids and other things that have to do with your health is going to make you aware of anything that needs to be addressed by your provider, your medical doctor. So again, I, I can't stress that enough. The research ethics require us to disclose anything that may be harmful to you, something that may be a threat to your health. So we are going to give you that kind of information. It may not have anything at all to do with the research that we're doing. Excellent. Okay, so of the 190 plus individuals on line with us right now, we would love for you to check in with Natalie Zimmerman or Crystal Davis. The number is 404 712 0212 to just inquire uh, about what the research opportunities are. You can also go to our website. It's www.alzheimers.emory.edu and click on the tab that says uh, clinical trials and studies at the top of the page. Okay, we're going to turn it over to one last thing, Cornelia. Let me just say yeah. this. If you are participating in our research and you need a neurologic assessment, we're going to help you get one. But you have to be an Emory patient to be in our um, cognitive empowerment program and some of the prevention things. Those are things that are generally not offered to the public. Disease trials are not offered to the healthy public. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Carla said, come on in, let us give us an update about what we can expect in the coming weeks. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Dorbin, for inviting me back and um, allowing me the opportunity to talk to everyone about the uh, clinics we have coming up. So we actually have two clinics. One is set for April 13th, and that will be from 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And it will be held via Zoom. But if you don't have high-speed internet, or you just don't know what Zoom is, don't let that dissuade you from attending this clinic because all you got to do is let us know you would prefer to call in and we can actually just give you a phone number to call in and you can speak to us. And this April 13th clinic is actually specifically for estate planning. So if you are a veteran living in Georgia or perhaps you're the spouse of a veteran living here in Georgia, uh, we can help you out with a will, 
a power of attorney or even an advanced directive for healthcare. And of course, a will is just simply a document that lets people know where you want your property to go after you pass. So where you want your home to go, uh, where you want your vehicle to go, your pearls to go. And then the power of attorney will actually allow you to give someone else authority to act on your behalf. So maybe you want to give someone the authority to open up a bank account on your behalf or sell a vehicle on your, on your behalf, um, anything like that. You uh, might need a power of attorney. And then of course, with the advanced directive for healthcare, that allows physicians and your family members to know about your medical preferences in case you are ever in a state where you can't make them known yourself. So maybe you're in an accident, you can't talk or you're incapacitated um, or for whatever reason, you can't make your medical preferences known. It's nice to have all of this stuff written down ahead of time in a document. So that's what the advanced directive for healthcare is all about. And then we actually have another clinic and this one is set for April 22nd, and this one will also be via Zoom, and it's from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., and actually, we're going to co-host this clinic with the Atlanta Legal Aid Society. Now, Atlanta Legal Aid Society is really a force multiplier for us because it allows us to address a broader range of issues, so our clinic will do estate planning, discharge upgrades, and VA disability benefits work, but Atlanta Legal Aid Society will do stuff like landlord-tenant disputes, foreclosure sale issues, uh, child custody issues, divorce issues, even things like social security benefits. So if you are a veteran living in Georgia and you need help in any of these areas, or again, a spouse of a veteran living in Georgia, uh, please give us a call and sign up for this April 22nd clinic. And our phone number is 404 727-1044. And I'm going to drop all of this information in the chat um, because you can also email us if you want to attend one or both of these clinics. And that would be roxana.poosh at emory.edu. And again, I'm going to drop that in the chat. And if, any, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, but that's all the information I have for today. Thank you. So they once they call, walk us through what they can expect. Yeah, so once they give us a call and let us know that they want to attend the clinic, our paraprofessional, Roxana, will actually give them all the information they need, whether they want to sign on via Zoom to join the clinic or if they just want to call in. And then what will happen is on the day of the clinic, you can uh, join us and you will be assigned an attorney. And a law student may also be there because we have some law students that are interested in this area of the law and we want to help them learn. Um, but in any event, um, you will be sent off into a breakout room with an attorney and maybe a law student and you'll just tell us about your issues. And, um, you know, if we have follow up questions or whatnot, we will go through that with you. And then they will actually be virtually signing or um, authorizing these documents? If on the, uh, on the wills, for instance, uh, what we would do is we would top everything up and we would send the will, if that's what we prepared to you, and we would give you um, a list of uh, potential places where you can take the document to get it signed because uh, wills do have to be signed by a notary public as do powers of attorney. Excellent. Okay, so uh, Mrs. Carson is going to drop all this information in the link. I want everyone, if you are a veteran or if you know someone who is a veteran or a spouse of a veteran that can benefit from this information, please share this information. Um, it is at no cost to the veterans. You know, I don't like to say free because nobody paid for it. We're just not passing that cost on to you. But um, this is specifically for veterans. Now, in the past, we have hosted similar clinics in person uh, in the community. And so I think that's something we will consider uh, in the near future, perhaps in the fall, if uh, the School of Law is interested in hosting those programs again. But right now, it's just for veterans. And what's the difference between a will and a trust before we uh, transition to our final 15 minutes of programming. 
Sure, so sometimes you might want to have um, property, um, be it real property or personal property held in trust. Um, for, so for instance, sometimes a trust is held for uh, beneficiaries that are not yet 18 years of age. So you uh, might have children, for instance, that are let's say seven and 10 and you want property to pass to them, um, but you don't want them to get it until they're 18 or maybe 21 or some people even you know, say something like 26. Um, so you might use a trust to do something like that. Um, sometimes trusts can get very complicated. Uh, we tend to focus more on the basic wills um, but of course, if you have questions about trust, you know, hopefully we can answer those for you. Um, but yeah, that's basically the difference between a trust and a will. And some people actually think that a will is just about decide or telling people where your property should go. And that's not necessarily the case. You can even use a will to make known your funeral arrangements. So you can state in your will, hey, I wish to be buried uh, specifically at Cemetery X, or maybe you don't want to be buried at all, and you can use a will to make known your preference to be cremated. Heck, we've even had clients say, I want my body burned down to ashes. I want the ashes compressed into a stone and set on a platinum ring. So I, I even had a, a client one time say that they don't want a funeral. They want a party, and they want specific songs played and whatnot. So the sky really is the limit. Um, but yeah, th that's really the basics of, of a will and, and a trust. Okay, well, yes, it is for veterans only. I, I, you know, we, our veterans are dear to us, our older adults are dear to us. And as I mentioned, we have hosted these programs for the general public in the past, and that is something we may consider doing in the fall. All right, well, let's get on moving. We're covering a lot as we usually do in a short amount of time. And uh, Dr. Johnson, will you come on and I'm going to hand you the remote so that you can uh, advance your slides and share this great update with us today. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Um, get everything going. Okay, so today I just wanted to talk to you for a, a brief moment about navigating difficult situations with a person living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, I in no way am an expert. I am a postdoc in the School of Nursing. And before that, and before my research um, trajectory and career, I was, a, I was and still am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner um, and, and work currently at the Integrative Memory Care Clinic at Emory. And so I am combining things I've learned in research, things that have happened in my own clinical experience, as well as different things I've, I've um, read to try and give you some tips and strategies around these situations. So when we think about potential difficult situations, um, that could include driving. So the person living with dementia is now at a point where he or she no longer wants to drive, or maybe the family, uh, a caregiver or care partner is concerned about their driving. Cooking is another situation, um, as well as living arrangements. And so these situations in and of themselves are not necessarily difficult, but the tension between really wanting to um, keep the person living with dementia safe while sort of uh, managing and navigating the tension around the personhood of that individual is a word we use a lot in research. So still wanting to honor their values, wishes, um, and who they were before and during this uh, dementia trajectory can create um, some difficult situations. And so navigating conversations around driving. So when there's agreement, of course, with agreement, things tend to flow a little easier. And so it may be the discussion around who is gonna start taking over these driving responsibilities, who is at the table having these conversations? Is it the family? Is it the care partners, the person with dementia, their, a neighbor or a friend, um, just being cognizant of who all is involved in, in this discussion. Um, changing a driver's license to a photo ID because you know we still need proof of who we are. So um, that can be another potential um, thing to consider when, when transitioning from driving. And then when there's disagreement, what does that look like? Um, and it may be that we need to move the car or cover it. The idea of sometimes things being out of sight are often out of mind. 
um, especially if the person living with dementia was someone who did a lot of the driving, um, keeping the car keys out of sight, um, and even disconnecting the car battery. I have had, um, in clinical practice, I have had someone tell me that they um, put the club, remember those clubs that they sold that would go on the um, steering wheel to keep people from stealing them? I've had a, a care partner, a son did that for his mother to keep her from driving. But again, it kind of depends on the relationship that you have with a person living with dementia and what those relational dynamics are like. Um, and then I would say involve the primary care provider or your PCP as well as the healthcare team when possible. Um, personally, I have had um, individuals placed on my caseload, a primary care provider um, had me see an individual, an older gentleman and his adult children. They came into my private practice when I was uh, working here um, in the community and um, the adult children were concerned about the father continuing to drive. Um, we did some cognitive testing and after they shared their concerns in some different situations with him getting lost and, and, and really seeming like um, he could be a danger to himself or other individuals on the road, I did make the recommendation to his um, family that he not drive. And he became extremely upset with me and stormed out of my office. Um, but one thing that I will say sometimes with involving multiple people or healthcare teams is that it didn't sever the relationship that this man had with his primary care provider and it didn't sever the relationship that he had with his family. And so sometimes you have to call an outside provider in um, if that is at your disposal to create um, a bad guy um, who can be the one to deliver um, messaging that, that family members and care partners and, and maybe primary healthcare team members don't want to necessarily deliver. But again, it's so unique. There is no one size fits all. Um, it really is about sort of knowing the dynamics in your own family and, and relationship and caregiving situation and really trying to navigate that situation. So navigating conversations about cooking again, when there's agreement, it's who will take over these responsibilities who is going to be involved in this, in this um, conversation, maybe cooking simpler meals for individuals who are still in that earlier stage, or um, providing one-step instructions or cooking together is another option. Again, when there's disagreement, um, cooking together could potentially be an option. Sometimes people just want to be in the room where the cooking is happening. It really kind of depends on how involved the person living with dementia was in cooking and, and their stage, the dementia stage and progression. And then again, sometimes um, it, it may be time to transition to appliances that automatically turn off if persons living with dementia are partaking in some of these processes and not wanting to leave appliances on all day um, or possibly removing knobs or unplugging appliances if there is concern about the person living with dementia safety and um, conversations have not been helpful. Navigating conversations about living arrangements. Um, again, when there's agreement, determining the best place to live, this is often not just a situation or a discussion with the person living with dementia and the care partner or caregiver. There's often other family and friends and the healthcare team that can be involved in making suggestions. Um, when there's disagreement, is a compromise possible? Um, Again, thinking about personhood and safety and really wanting to make the best decisions um, for everyone involved. And when a compromise isn't possible, is there a way to still um, evaluate the situation periodically, maybe on a monthly basis or bi-monthly basis as the dementia symptoms continue, um, as things progress, sometimes there can be compromise and, and things can be resolved sooner um, or as time passes. And then again, including the primary care provider and healthcare team where possible to give suggestions and strategies um, on how to navigate this. Um, thank you. Um, and do we have any questions? Thank you. What a wonderful um, presentation. We'll have to have you come back on to talk about um, just managing the stress on top of a pandemic and having to sort of maintain this uh, shelter yeah. in place as older adults. 
Ms. Taylor has a question saying at what point may a person living with Alzheimer's be placed in hospice? Um, hospice is more towards um, end of life. So usually um, it's more related to where, um, like I was saying, sort of end of life decision making, end of end of the disease trajectory. Often, individuals may not be eating on their own. It's more often about sort of, um, and I don't want to misquote because hospice and palliative care are both close, but they're slightly different. Um, but I do know it is later in the disease trajectory. If you're wanting specifics, give me a minute. Come on. Yeah, I would message um, Dr. Von Johnson directly or um, Dr. Parker, if you want to come in. Um, so if a neighbor is showing problems and they don't have a, a identified family or um, a designated person, who, who do we ask for help? What agency do we call? Well, I think um, the um, Department of Family Services is the person that you can call, but I think immediately you might call law enforcement. And I'm saying that you might call simply because I know in DeKalb County, there has been special training given to uh, police officers to kind of help assess people with mental health problems and other things. Um, driving and getting lost isn't so much of a problem, Driving is a significant problem, but if there are other things that are showing up, the easiest thing to do is to call law enforcement. Um, and they have um, special services for people like this. I mean, you've seen Maddie's call and things like that. If you know somebody who has a problem, you know, you might wanna get some of these special badges, but if family members are not immediately available. There's usually a neighbor who knows who to call, but if somebody is having problems as indicated in the question, the easier thing is to call law enforcement so that they can get the people and put them in, I'm gonna call it protective custody. Um, Department of Family and Children's Services is a whole lot of governmental stuff and we don't have a whole lot of things uh, that, that can protect us. So the easier thing is to certainly call law enforcement, particularly if you see somebody wandering about because they can apprehend them and they can get them to a place uh, where they can be safe um, or put them in an environment where they can be safe until um, family or other responsible persons can be made available. Okay, thank you. And then there are a few more questions if uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Parker can address those. Um, so we are going to have Wit come on and talk about healthy aging. And next week, Wit, I'm going to put you at the top of the hour because we start to go down the road with all of our questions and we lose track of time. So come on in, tell us about healthy aging and how people can participate. And we'll bring you on in the beginning of the program next week. So you have more time to go into a lot more detail about this amazing study. And then Matt's going to tell you how to access CEP at three o'clock today. All right, uh, and if I could share my screen, Cornelia, I want to be able to show a short video here that I put together. Um, so for those that are joining for the first time here, my name is Whit. I am the communication specialist for the Emory uh, Healthy Aging Study and the Emory Healthy Brain Study. And uh, as Dr. Parker mentioned earlier, the Emory Healthy Aging Study is a really cool opportunity to get involved with research because it's done actually entirely online. And so what we ask our participants to do is to complete an online health history questionnaire once a year and then to update it uh, each year with any new information. And it's going to ask you questions about uh, general demographics where you want to know about how much exercise you're getting. You know, that's one of the reasons we start off each one of these webinars with an exercise demonstration because it's that important to us. Uh, we also want to know what, what's that diet like. Are you eating enough fruits and vegetables? Uh, are you reading? What are your hobbies? You know, do you play musical instruments and that kind of stuff? And so it takes most people about 30, 40 minutes to complete. 
Uh, and since it's done entirely online, I have a little short video here that actually walks you through the registration process just to show you how easy it is. But before I start that, I do want to note that this uh, opportunity for research is open to anybody that is over the age of 18, uh, as long as you live in the United States or one of the territories. And if you can read and understand English with a internet connected device, you can participate here. And so the way that you would actually go about getting involved if you wanted to join the study is done through our website, healthyaging.emory.edu. And I'll drop that here in the chat box in just a moment, as well as my email address. But when you go to our website here, you will see a join the study button in the upper right hand corner. And when you click on that, that's what starts this process. And it's broken down into four steps where you will actually register your account with our portal. That's how you log in to actually complete your health history questionnaire. Uh, we'll go through an online consent process. And that online consent process is the same thing that if you were going to be uh, doing participating in research in person, um, you will always go through an informed consent to make sure you understand, you know, what are you being asked to do? Um, what kind of information are we collecting? What kind of options do you have with the research opportunities? And so this one, again, here is done entirely on our portal. And once you go through the consent process, we do collect a little bit of contact information from you. And this is largely in part um, because if you move or we need to get in contact with you for some reason, or we have some questions about the, uh, the research here, we want to make sure that we can definitely reach out to you. And I will speed this last part up here. I do want to note, though, at the bottom part of this uh, contact information, we ask you what kind of emails do you want to receive? So we definitely want to be cognizant of, you know, not sending you too much stuff. Um, occasionally, we might send out additional two or three minute surveys when we work with other researchers. But this allows you to choose what kind of information you get. And then when you hit next, that final step here is actually completing the health history questionnaire. So as you can see, from the time that you click join the study, you never have to leave or go to some other uh, portal or anything else. It's done entirely here online. And like I mentioned before, I'm going to drop my email address and our web address here into the chat box. If you have questions or you want to learn more about getting involved, please don't hesitate to contact me directly. All right. Okay, Matt, who is going to be featured on... Uh cognitive empowerment program right now. Hey everyone, so uh, Megan Nair, our yoga um, specialist, as well as our facilitator for live programming, she is gonna be joining us today. She's gonna be doing a uh, yoga workout. And for people who have never done yoga, I highly recommend coming to check it out. Megan does an incredible job and she makes it really like accessible to new people. She talks about um, all kinds of things, whether it's breathing exercises, uh, mind, uh, mindfulness, meditation, all. she'll kind of like touch on those things and, and it's going to be a really great workout. So please come and join us. And you're going to drop the link if, and it's a recurring link. So if you have been registered for it, um, you don't have to register again. It should pop up. It's an automated uh, reminder each week. And the program is immediately following our Brain Talk Live. I think one person had a comment, Dr. Parker didn't know if you wanted to address about, you know, um, contacting the police, uh, the non-emergency number, the 911, the fire department. Um, I think in every- I put a department, county, I did put an aging number, adult protective services number in there, a toll-free number. Okay, perfect. I and I, I think in the for chat. every- Every county and every city sort of has, you know, different municipalities have different um, um, resources available. And I think as we're introducing you to uh, the different resources, I would encourage you to um, do your own research so that if you do encounter these types of scenarios, you are informed uh, because we don't know the particulars, you know, of your specific city, county, state. There are people joining us from literally all over the world and while our information is specific to Georgia, um, you may have you know, far more resources and accessibility in some areas than others. So we just wanna empower you. We want you to make good informed uh, decisions as we continue to bring you this information and share it with others. Okay, hop on over, join uh, the Cognitive Empowerment Program.
and we will see you back here next week at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you. Thank you.